on June 6, 2006, a woman who appeared to be in her 30s and only going by the name of Judith calmly walked into the Arizona State Mental Hospital in Phoenix. She indicated to the staff she was admitting herself. She was asked why, but said she would not say until she was admitted and spoke to a therapist. An hour later, she was admitted. The following day, she told her story to one of the therapists who was working that shift. This is a story Judith told the therapist who asked not to be named. 46,000 homeless people die every year, but no one knows exactly how many simply disappear. But I do. I was born on June 6, 1906 in Salem, Massachusetts. Life was good for a while, having come from an upscale family that took everything for granted. That is, until 1929. I can still vividly remember my father coming home on the evening of October 30th. We were all sitting at the dinner table like normal, waiting for him as he walked through the door. His head was down and looked as if someone had snatched his soul from his body. He was usually a charismatic, energetic man, but I didn't recognize this person. Instead of coming to sit down and eat, he calmly hung up his hat and jacket, said nothing, then walked upstairs to his room. We all looked at each other with concerned looks. As my mother stood up to go check on him, we heard a loud bang that seemed to shake the very foundation of our house. I lowered my head and started crying. Even back then, I was smart enough to know what just took place. My mother shouted out, Paul, what was that? As she ran through the hallway, heading upstairs. My siblings simply stared at me with confused looks until Jacob spoke up asking, What's happened, Judith? What was that loud bang? I said nothing as I continued crying. Our mother's screams rattled us as she shouted out, No, 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 my Paul. My siblings scrambled from the kitchen table and ran upstairs. I can still hear their hysterical cries in my head to this day. I sat at the dining table for hours, never moving, and I never saw my father again. We buried him a few days later. The next week we found out why my father had taken his life. He'd lost everything in the crash the day before and we were left with nothing. It wasn't long before we were forced to leave our house and fend for ourselves on the streets. My mother was an orphan with no family to speak of. My father's parents were dead and he'd all but disowned his siblings due to them trying to take advantage of the wealth he had before. We had no one we could turn to for help being most of the people we were friends with had also lost everything. Being it was the start of winter, my mother spent what little money she had left and we traveled down south where it was warmer to start over. Little did she know that was going to further descend us into hell. It took some time to make it down there, but when we did, we ended up in a homeless shelter in Birmingham, Alabama. We stayed there for a while and things were alright, but as winter approached, more people moved into the city. The shelter got crowded and we were forced out. We ended up living in an abandoned building on the edge of the city. My mother found work at a factory as I attended to my siblings during the day. Her pay was so low we'd still have to scavenge for food or find other ways to eat. When she'd come back from working all day, I'd head out to try and find food or use what little money she made to buy some. It went on like this for months until May 1930. I don't recall the exact day. Mother had come back later than usual that night as I stood up to leave to go get food and fresh water for us. She looked extremely tired and I could see a look of defeat in her eyes as she handed me the money she'd made that day and I left. I usually wasn't gone very long, but being it was late, the store I frequent was closed, so I had to walk further to another one that was open. As I walked back, I remember thinking how bright it was, even with how late it was. I looked up into the sky and could see the full moon above the tall buildings. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen a full moon or paid attention to it. Right then, I got an eerie feeling that something was not right, and got so scared my ears started ringing. I paused looking all around me but there was nothing, just the silence of an empty street. It was then I hastened my steps as I continued on home. When I reached the outside of the building we lived in, I could hear loud murmuring but thought it was only my siblings fighting. I stopped and lit a candle before going up the stairs. It wasn't until I got to the fourth floor I could hear the horrific shrieks of my family. 
I dropped everything except the candle and took off running down the hallway towards our room. As I got closer, I could see the room was pitch black. As I ran into the room, something immediately knocked the candle out of my hand, but not before I saw a glimpse of what I thought was some type of beast, something I'd never seen before or thought could have existed. I was then hit so hard it sent me across the room with such force it knocked me out. I had the most horrible dreams while I was out. I dreamt I was looking through the eyes of something that was not me. I was hunting down a young couple who were walking down the street. Right as I was about to pounce on them, I jolted myself awake. I jumped up and started looking around for my family, but they were gone. Only the red stains of their blood remained. I looked down at myself and noticed my clothes were torn to shreds and I was covered in dried blood, but no marks or wounds were on me. I scoured the entire building hoping to find my family, but found no trace of them. Next to my father taking his life, that was the worst day of my life. I was in such disarray, I couldn't even cry. I sat in that blood-stained room all day, thinking about what to do next. If I went to the police, I knew they'd do nothing, as there was nothing to find, other than the blood stains, which I might get blamed for. I made the decision to make my way down to the coast and catch a boat to Europe. There was nothing left for me in America. Before going to sleep that night, I needed more water and food, so I went out. The last thing I remember as I was walking down the street was having what appeared to be a very lucid dream. I was again looking through the eyes of something that was not me. This time, though, I was in a bedroom with two young children that were fast asleep. I slowly crept up and glared at them for several seconds before tearing them to pieces. In my mind, I was screaming at myself to stop, but could not. I was in an utter horror as I was about to eat pieces of them when suddenly I woke up and found myself back in the blood-stained room. I screamed out as I looked down and was shocked to see I had different clothing on than what I had on before. This can't be happening. Why? Why? I said aloud to myself as I cried. I wasted no time leaving Birmingham that day. Three days later, after walking and getting rides from strangers, I made it to Mobile. I asked around and found a cargo ship that was headed to Portugal, and made friends with one of the crew members who was about my age. He agreed to let me stay in the cargo hold as long as I kept out of sight the entire time. He said he'd bring me food and water when I needed it. I have no idea how long the trip took, but it was long and I never left the cargo hold. When we arrived, he snuck me off the ship and I never saw him again. My first few days there were rough as I did not speak or read the language. I slept in the streets and ate leftovers from the garbage until I found a homeless shelter that let me in. It was there everything was about to change. It was evening as I went inside and sat down to eat. After taking a few bites I noticed a man several tables away who looked to be in his fifties who would not stop staring at me. At first I thought he was just being creepy until he came and sat down across from me. I've never met another one from America, he said in a thick accent I didn't recognize. I looked at him with a puzzled look before I spoke, saying, What are you talking about? How did you know I'm from America? You must have turned not long ago. Sensing others who are the same will come in time. As for where you came from, I smelled it on you as soon as you walked through the door, he replied. Turned into what? I don't understand, I said. Were you recently attacked by something you couldn't explain? He asked. I sat there in silence, shocked he knew, but eventually found the words. Yes, whatever it was killed my entire family, leaving only the stains of their blood. And now you've become one, he said. One what? I asked. We've been called many names over the years. To some, we're known as death. To others, we're one of God's mistakes, he replied. There was a long silence between us, then he asked, When was the last time you were outside under a full moon? I paused for a while, wondering why he was asking. Then it hit me. Back in America, and I had the most sadistic, horrifying dream I'd ever had. It felt so real, I replied. That happens in the beginning stages. You don't know what you are yet, but I will show you what was never shown to me, he said. Even before he said that, I felt like there had been a change inside me. Something was very different with my body. I had cravings for things I'd never had before. 
I felt stronger and more aware of my surroundings. After we finished eating, he stood up and said, Come with me. All right, I replied as I stood up and began following him. I'm not sure why, but I instinctively felt like I could trust him. When we walked outside, he looked up at the sky and said, The next full moon is in seven days. That's enough time to prepare you. Prepare me for what? I asked. He grinned slightly at me and said, You shall see. We spent the night wandering the streets of Lisbon. He talked for hours, telling me stories and explaining some things I needed to know. What we were, the history of our kind, what we needed, and what will kill us. It felt surreal as he laid it all out. I'd heard and read the stories growing up but never believed any of them. He said there are people who believe in our kind, and if I'm found by them, they will kill me. We spent the next six days keeping a low profile. The day before the full moon, he said, You have to kill every full moon. Who you kill is of the utmost importance. You must kill those who will not be missed or searched for. You must kill the homeless. Doing otherwise will get you killed by those whose constant search is for us. I then knew why my family was killed, which should have brought me to tears. But not only had my body gotten stronger, but my mind had as well. As evening approached on the first day of the full moon, we went and stood across the street from the homeless shelter. When the shelter got full, the rest were turned away, seeking out somewhere else to sleep. We watched as the remaining homeless began to leave, with one man going away from the crowd. We will follow him, do as I do, he whispered. We waited until he was several blocks away, then we began hunting him. Once the moon hits its peak, you will transform. A full moon gives us life and power. Without it, we are nothing. Always remember that, he said. We followed him until the man made his way to his makeshift camp away from the city as we remained in the shadows waiting for the moon to hit its peak. Hours went by as I grew anxious knowing the time was near. It's not long now. You will still not have control over yourself when you transform. That will come with time. Let your instincts take over, he said. I said nothing as I nodded my head. He then looked up into the sky, looked down at me and said, It is now time, my child. Right then, I felt myself begin to change, and like before, it felt like I was looking through the eyes of something that was not me. Only this time, it wasn't like a dream. I was aware of what was happening, but still could not control my new self. We slowly crept up to the man who was sleeping, then began tearing him apart as we ate the pieces, until there was nothing left except for his bloodied clothing which we disposed of later, so there was no evidence. It all happened so fast, the man never knew what took his life. That night was a turning point in my life, and I fully embraced what I'd become. We traveled all over Europe and parts of Asia for decades as he continued teaching me about our kind and what I needed to know in order to survive. Forty years later, we decided to part ways as I longed to return to America to see how it had changed, and him not ever wanting to leave the old world. I knew I'd never see him again. A lot had changed over the span of forty years. I was able to board a plane this time, and what took weeks or months now took hours. I landed in Seattle and spent the next decade working my way down the coast, eventually settling in Phoenix. I can't say I remember most of my kills, save for a few. The one I vowed would be my last will haunt me till the day my soul departs this earth. Over the years, I'd kill anyone with no remorse, women, children, the young, the old, it didn't matter. For some reason, the last one struck me deep. I've been following a mother and her two young children as I planned on killing them. They were living in an abandoned house away from anyone else, which was good as no one would hear their screams. Right before the moon peaked, I made my way to the house. Once inside, I could hear them talking and laughing. This made me pause for a moment, but the hunger pushed me forward. I'll never forget the looks of dread on their faces as I entered the room they were in. They immediately started screaming as I ran over, quickly killing the mother, then turned on one of the children. As I was about to kill the last child, I paused to look at his face. He looked exactly like my little brother Jacob. 
I was taken aback and couldn't believe what I was seeing. He stood up, getting ready to run, when instinct took over and I quickly dispatched him. After eating them and transforming back to myself, something inside me had changed. I made the decision that night to end my life, but not in the way you were able to do it. I can't simply put a gun to my head and pull the trigger. In order for me to die, I must stay out of the very thing that gives me power in life, the moon. So I was asked why I was admitting myself here. Now you have your answer. The therapist naturally assumed Judith was crazy and she was allowed to stay. Over the months, she told her life stories to the same therapist who recorded them. As months went by, something unexplainable happened. Her appearance began to drastically change. Each day, she seemed to grow older and older until she had the appearance of a hundred-year-old woman and could barely move. Eight months after admitting herself to the hospital, she was found in her bed, shriveled and dead. There was no explanation as to why she'd suddenly grown older. She was cremated and her ashes were spread in the desert just outside of Phoenix by her therapist. For more scary horror stories, please subscribe.